the Stun server would help me figure out what the remote IP is. But with CGN, that usually isn't enough. I also need what's called a turn relay. So basically, it means that with CGN, I can't directly talk to somebody else anymore. Now I have to go through a relay. So this, this is where some of the hidden costs of CGN come in. Because if I'm the person that's supporting like that voice or video service, now I have to have relays on the internet. And all of that traffic has to relay through me, which I have to, means I have to incur a lot of bandwidth expenses. So I, I do hear a lot that people will say, eh, you know, who cares, just put more layers of that, it doesn't cost me anything. Well, it depends. If you just run a simple website, probably won't cost you anything, right? As long as you don't do things like embed addressing in your authentication. <laughs> but if you run any kind of a communication service, that's not true, right? That there is a cost. It's, it's, it's kind of incremental, it's subtle, but th th these are the kinds of things that CGA <coughs> introduces. Okay, so we talked about CGN as a preservation strategy, but if I keep growing, at some point I need more addresses. So how do I get the addresses? The way I get the addresses is the market. So I can go to the market. Um, this, is, this is one broker. I mean, there's, there's tons of them. And essentially the going rate for an IPv4 address is somewhere between you know, 8 and 11 bucks an address. So uh, you know, for some, especially for smaller companies, you know, if I have a class A address, it's worth 150 million, you know, that's some money. So, so a, lot, a lot of people are selling and trading addresses. Now it's still, at the end of the day, it still has to get approved by the, by the uh, regional internet registry, um, but there's a lot of people who really need addresses badly. So there's a lot of activity going on here. Um, one, one, again, I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but one thing you'll notice if you look at this is, the smallest address is a slash 24 which is 256 addresses. You'll notice that there are no smaller transactions, and that's because <coughs> on the internet, right now, that's the smallest block you can route. Um, and it'll be interesting as we try and stretch <coughs> IPv4 further and further to see if the ISPs will be willing to, to accept more. Because the, there are problems. There's, anyway, I, there's so many details, but I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But, uh, but there, there are a lot of, and even with buying an address, there's a lot of stuff you have to watch for. Is you know, is the block clean? Is somebody else trying to advertise it? Was it used for malicious activity so it's on blacklist? So I mean, this is not this is not trivial. You need you need to spend some time thinking, but but it is an option. Okay, so that was the IPv4 story. So I want to talk a little about IPv6. Um, now, before I start talking about where we're at with adoption. One thing I wanted to point out is, um, I don't hear it much anymore, but every once in a while I'll still hear somebody say, like, eh, IPv6, it's too hard, you know, it's too different. <coughs> Can't we have like an IPv4.1 or something where maybe we just add a fifth octet instead of, you know, quadrupling the address size? And you know, at first that might sound kind of good, but I, I want to talk about this for a minute because it's important to think about if I have a new global communication standard, how long would it take to develop and adopt that? And basically, if I start thinking through that, even if I added a fifth octet to IPv4, right, to try and stretch it out, that means that, first of all, I'd have to go to all the operating system manufacturers, right? So, so Google, Apple, Microsoft, all the Linux distros, all the Unix manufacturers, all the real-time OSs, I'd have to get all those guys to agree mm -hmm that my specification makes sense and they're gonna have their developers implement it. And the first thing that any one of those guys would say is they'd be like, show me your approved RFC from the IETF. And you'd be like, okay, fine. So <laughs> I'm gonna go through the IETF, okay? So I'm gonna propose my standard, the IETF, you know, if I'm lucky, five years later, I'm gonna have an approved standard, if I'm lucky, okay? <laughs> now, then I have to go back to those OS guys and say, please, 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 please implement this. And they're gonna say, well, Show me that there's a market driver, or show me that people are going to adopt it. You know, and then, and then I'm going to have to go to the ISPs. And you get the idea, right? Generally speaking, we can kind of look. To come up with a new standard and get it deployed is, is typically close to 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. By the time you go through the standards bodies, you convince everybody to write the code. You actually get the code rolled out into production, get people using it. I mean, if you start thinking about all, the whole world, right, to adopt it, it's, it's not a trivial process, because there's a lot of other great ideas. So people are going to say, there's 100 people that have great ideas. Why should I listen to yours? So it's not so easy. 
So I don't hear this anymore, but if somebody says to you, ah, don't worry about IPv6, there's going to be something else. <coughs> you know, there are some other things, like there's something called MDM, which is pretty sweet. But I mean, no matter how awesome it is, it's at least 10 years out. And I don't, I don't think the internet can survive for that long on IPv4. So keep that in mind. Now, that said, so the, the only realistic plan we have to get away from IPv4 and move to something else is IPv6. And kind of looking at it, um, what I want to spend a little bit of time on is where is IPv6 at? And really the more important question is, when is it interesting for you? Right? And I'm hoping I can give you enough of a definition of interesting that, that you can formulate the answer for yourself. So this is usually what most people show. In fact, there was, you know, there was a lot of press that, ooh, IPv6 is over 10%. This is, this is actually not a good source because this is Google's view of the world. <laughs> and, and that's not a bad view, but for example, if I go to China, is Google a major player in China? No, right? China is one of the largest internet markets in the world. So, you know, this is, this is an interesting data point, but it's not really a good data point if I'm looking at global traffic, right? So, um, in the US, Google is, you know, still one of, one of the top players. Um, although Facebook is bigger. So the other thing too, I think a lot of people see this and they think it represents everywhere. But this is just Google's view of the world. If we look at the US, in the US, Google sees about 24% of their traffic come over, or 24% 20, of the users that visit you, Google are IPv6 capable, right? And actually Facebook's percentage is higher. Facebook's percentage is probably closer to 30%. People are actually using it. Yeah. That's a good question, capable. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So I, I will, that's an excellent question. I will come back to that. You're, uh, that's an uh, excellent. Your the first time you came here to talk about it was uh, January of 2013, and we were at one percent. Yeah, it's so mm -hmm. it's you know now we're yeah. at ten percent. That's so it's it's you know it's it's definitely it's happening. It's definitely at the point where it's interesting. Is it interesting enough to take action? I mean, it de depends on where you're at. Yeah. Okay. Now there are three major public sources of IPv6 data. There's Google, there's Atmic Labs, and there's Akamai, right? So we talked about Google, everybody knows who Google is. You might not know who Atmic Labs is. So Atmic is one of the regional internet registries, right, for Asia Pacific, and Atmic Labs is under Atmic, and the guy who runs that is named Jeff Houston. And Jeff Houston, if you get into anything with internet data, he is the man. I mean, everybody, I mean, Gartner, Google, I mean, anybody in technology, if you ask them anything about internet statistics, they're going to talk about Jeff Houston. I mean, everybody treats him, this guy is awesome. He, he is like the statistician for the internet. So, um, I like his data the best, and, every, and the great thing too is, I encourage you to be skeptical. In fact, I got questioned last year, I don't believe this. Even like when I talked to Gartner, Gartner said, that's not end to end. So, um, this paper right here, and I'll share this with Jim so you can click on the link. Google published a paper explaining how do we measure traffic, right? And the way they do it is your browser downloads JavaScript. The JavaScript tries to connect to a one by one IPv4 pixel, one by one IPv6 pixel, and a dual stack one to basically see are you IPv4 capable? Are you IPv6 capable? If you're dual stack, which one do you prefer? That's how they measure it. They do a random sampling. But don't take my word for it. Go read the paper. Right? Again, be informed. Read the data. Look at everything. Make your own decision. Because you should be confident in whatever choice you make that it's the right choice and you're confident in the data that you looked at. Same thing for Atmic Labs. Actually, I like their system better. And actually, Google is a major sponsor, by the way. So Google does not view them as a competitor. Atmic Labs actually use syndicated ads. So they use JavaScript, Flash, and HTML5, and they use the syndicated ad system on the internet, and basically they do the same thing, where they try and connect you to a v4, v6, or a dual stack resource. And by doing that, um, Atmic Labs thinks the US penetration rate is around 30%. So again, Jim, excellent question. 30% penetration or adoption, this is capability. This means this, per this percentage of users is capable of speaking IPv6. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they are, only that they can. But when they, when they say capable, it means from the user's browser all the way through to Google or Atmic, that entire connection end to end is IPv6 capable. That's what that means. Okay, and
And then the, the third one is Akamai. So Akamai is a content distribution network. So if I'm Apple or Microsoft or somebody and I publish patches or updates and millions of people are downloading it, no one web server can handle that. So I use a CDN. The CDN distributes it out to the entire world and then everybody can download stuff at high speed. So among CDNs, Akamai is the 500 pound gorilla. They are the largest by far and they serve about a third of the world's traffic. So they're in a pretty good position to judge. Um, actually, their percentage has been going down. It peaked at 20 and it's actually gone down. So I don't know, um, Akamai mainly serves the enterprise and the enterprise has, has not, has been somewhat cool towards IPv6 outside of Silicon Valley. So, um, and you can, you can definitely see it there. So, so a lot of the adoption is more with um, carriers, content providers, and residential users, and not as much in the enterprise. Um, but you can see, like, if you look at the top 10 from each, you know, it, it's markedly different. Um, but it, but it's, not, it's not way off. You know, it, it's, it's, it's in the ballpark. So, but I mean, even as you can see by these numbers, I mean, the traction with IPv6 in the last couple of years is pretty significant. Right? So Belgium, you know, depending on who you believe, a third to half their traffic is IPv6, or a third to half of uh, their users are IPv6 capable. So I mean, that's, that's significant. <coughs> okay, so when does this get interesting? So when I'm evaluating a technology, I would say that it gets interesting when it hits critical mass. And critical mass, depending on who you ask, is somewhere between 10 and 20%. So in the US, we are definitely there. Now, as soon as you cross the critical mass threshold, does that mean it's interesting to you? Mm -hmm. It depends. You know, so if I'm a Silicon Valley company, most of the Silicon Valley companies, or a lot of the Silicon Valley companies have already deployed. In fact, like if I look at like Apple or Google or Oracle, Apple's actually IPv6 only. They, they basically decided that IPv6 is it, and they're totally eliminated IPv4. So basically, at the internet border, they don't do NAT64, they do NAT46, because they're IPv6 only. Google is, is basically a similar direction. Oracle, Microsoft, Apple, LinkedIn, all those guys are you know, fully dual stack, fully deployed, done for years. Right? So there are some companies that are already there. Um, now, um, what, I, what I did here is, uh, Google and Apnic Labs have been collecting data for the last three or four years. So using that data, you can actually do a statistical projection and say, okay, based on the data, where do I think we're going to be? And uh, I can say with a fairly high confidence interval, those numbers should end up being pretty close. I would say plus or minus, you know, five to ten percent. So I would say in a year, we're going to be at fifty percent capability. Not usage capability. So half half the users will be able to use it. Um, 2017 will be at a super majority, and then beginning of 2018 will be at 80 percent. Question: Do you really think those uh, that growth is going to continue to hold? Because I know when um, you know you, we got a handful of really large carriers that serve most of the home users in the United States. And I know, for instance, Comcast was demoing. I think they've actually rolled it out. I'm not a Comcast user currently, but I mean that's a huge quantity of users right there that a lot of them don't even know. It just starts. Being yeah, available just, just one day, um, <clears throat> and you know, we have the large tech companies and the enterprises that have the technical savvy staff. But I mean, I have a history over 20 years plus in IT of dealing with a lot of smaller companies where they're frankly just struggling to get by. I mean, basic firewalling, IPv4, DNS. I mean, it's still, <coughs> you know, that's kind of making the leap to IP, IPv6 isn't even at all anywhere close to the wheelhouse where they're going to be anytime soon. I mean, it's got, I and all those places still need to talk, <coughs> all the business to business stuff, things. Sure. I see that hitting a, a wall really soon. Um, I, it's, it's a good point. And, and the truth is, I, you know, I don't know. You know. Will these numbers hold? I think they will. But it, now, once, once you get here, it's probably going to be a very long tail, right? Yeah. Uh, now, I think a lot of enterprises are kind of like a home user, right? If IPv6 is totally easy and it just works, then they might use it. If it doesn't, they won't. But, but it's really, it's pretty much gotten to that point, right? Because Comcast is a good example. If I have Xfinity, it's fully deployed. If my home router supports it, it, it just works. And, and that's how it has to be. If it's not like that, people won't use it. For sure. Um, now, now, again, though, this is just capability. <coughs> I'm, I'm not saying that 80% of people are going to use IPv6. I'm only saying that they will have the uh, they will have the capability to use it. 
because those are two very different things. So let me, um, let me come back to that in one second. And then if we look at this data, so here's the current estimated US population, estimated number of internet users. So 30% would be 84 million people that are capable of using it. That's, that's the current estimate. So you know, so it, it's significant. Now, let me throw some cold water on that, right? So I don't see like, I don't want to seem like an evangelist. This is the Amsterdam Internet Exchange. So an internet exchange is essentially a data center where all the major carriers or internet service providers and content providers all come together to peer with each other. It's an exchange point, right? So this is how all the traffic flows back and forth. We have, you know, maybe half a dozen of these in the U.S. and they're scattered throughout the world, right? These, this is like the, the junctions between all the internet service providers and, and uh, content providers. The Amsterdam Internet Exchange is one of the largest in the world. And Europe doesn't have, on average, it doesn't have quite as high of an adoption as the US, but it's pretty close. And if we look, in terms of volume or actual usage, the amount of IPv6 is about 1.2%. So I mean, it's 1.2% is, is actually significant, but it's, it's pretty small. Right, so in terms of actual traffic, it, the, the rate is pretty low, right? And, and to go back to your question about how many people are going to use it, right, again, capability and actually using it are two different things. So that's really, it's a very good question because if somebody has IPv6, when are they actually going to use it? And that, that's a really hard question to answer. I, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of a way to predict that. I can just predict the, the, the capability. Okay, so um, within the US, here's what it looks like for the major providers. So if I look at the major wireline providers, you know, the, the top three have a pretty good story. Comcast is fully, <coughs> fully deployed for residential. So if your router supports it, you have it. Um, AT&T is pretty far down the path. Time Warner Cable is, is, is moving along. However, if we get past the top three, Verizon is kind of a question mark. I know they're working on it, but they don't have a very good story to tell. CenturyLink, 0.1 percent, and if I look, if I look at six, seven, and eight, it's 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 not too much better. Wow! So said they didn't even have any plans when I asked. Who? Wow. Well, yeah, the small the smaller providers, you know, I mean, so you know, from a, if I put my business hat on, if I am a small wireline ISP, I have less than a million subscribers, which which in the ISP business makes me pretty small and I have plenty of addressing, and I have very little growth, you know, maybe I don't have a lot of incentive to do it, right? If, because the incentive is if I have growth, if I have new services, if I'm getting into IoT, if I'm in the M to M space, if I'm in the mobility space, then I have incentive. But if I don't have any of those things, then maybe I don't. So, so you know, it's that, that said, though, um, the US is kind of skewed in that if I look at the top five, I mean, that's probably just about 80% of the users. So I mean, the, the small ones might be drug along just because if all the big ones do it, they might have no choice. But, but again, that's, that's kind of hard to predict. Jim, as a home user, would I have any reason to demand, want, request my ISP to hook me up for six and, and be done with four? Do I get better performance out of it? Do I get better security? Do can, I get can I come back to that in a second? It's a good question. Um, let, let me get you in just one second, because I have some data. Um, and this is on, on, the, uh, on the wireless side. Um, on the wireless side, actually, AT&T and Sprint just started deploying this year. Um, however, um, the uh, what is it, the World, World IPv6 launch website that tracks all the carriers, um, basically, if I look at all wireless traffic in the U.S., over a third of wireless users are already IPv6 capable. And because with your phone, you refresh it every two to three years, this is going to ramp up really fast. So this is, I would say, as a business or as a person, if you do mobile apps, you absolutely should be all over IPv6. Because in a year or two, this is probably going to be 60 to 80 percent. Just because you have that constant refresh base, and also the growth here is, it continues to be really high because remember all those M to M devices are also using cellular connections. So there's tremendous growth and pressure on the address system. So for, for here, I, I think there is a good story. And then I threw in Hughes. 
Hughes is the largest satellite provider. They have over a million subscribers, and you know they're, they're doing pretty decent too. Okay, this this is um, this is probably too much into the weeds, but but just so you get an idea, if I look at all ISPs globally, so anybody who does transit, so in other words, if I'm trying to get to Yahoo and I'm going through somebody's network, <coughs> I'm not reaching Yahoo yet. I'm just traveling through the network. That's called the transit network. This is showing all my transit networks globally and how many of them have deployed IPv6. So if I look, the, the major ones are pretty far done. And this, this center here, this is basically kind of the core. All, all the tier ones, tier twos, all the top providers. The ones that haven't deployed tend to be more out at the edge where they're like the smaller ones. So from, from, the, from the internet core, it, 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 the story is pretty good. Okay, another, another interesting statistic is content. Right, so I have, I, I kind of have, I have my uh, my users, I have my ISPs, and then I have my content. So from a content point of view, do I have IPv6 content? So if I look at the top 1,000 sites, about 17% of them have IPv6 deployed. You know, so Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, Yahoo. Um, I'll, I'll show a list. There's there's a lot of major properties that have it. Um, however. As I go down to the smaller providers and I get out, outside the top 100,000, top million sites, the percentage gets pretty low, down to 6%. So for now, it seems to mostly be the bigger players. And I also thought it was kind of interesting, if we consider IPv6 a site element, like CSS or HTTP 2.0 or strict transport security, that's kind of how it ranks. So you know, it'll probably be a long time before it gets to 100% if ever, but um, you know, even even if even if it gets to half, that'd be significant. So like, look, half, half of websites don't even use cookies. So just to <coughs> kind of give a little bit of context around that. Okay, so I don't want to I don't want to spend too much time, but I <coughs> just to give a few examples of companies that are deployed, right? So um, a lot of people in Silicon Valley, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Oracle, um, almost all the operating system vendors have deployed it. So the only one, actually, I was a little surprised. The only one missing is Ubuntu. Um, they do not support IPv6. I was, I was a little surprised by that. But I, don't, when you say they don't support it, what do you mean? So the operating system does, because yeah. Linux is supported for a long time, but the company doesn't. If you look yeah. at their website, it's not supported. Ah. Um, so that surprised me a little, although when you see the cloud slide next, that might explain it a little, because really for Ubuntu Cloud is their focus. Um, networking vendors have pretty much all done it for a long time. Security is mostly pretty good. Common services, Netflix, Instagram. Um, however, there are a lot, so we saw, right, over 80% of companies haven't deployed it, so there are a lot of major companies that haven't. And I thought, it's interesting if you look in the industries. So cloud is a little surprising, right, because that's where there's one of the, the, the pressure is felt most acutely in cloud. There is tremendous exponential growth, getting address spaces really hard, and yet the cloud providers are dragging their feet. So that, that's an interesting one. So I, I didn't have put IBM Software up here, they're number four. They actually have fully deployed IPv6. Um, but if we look at the top three, Amazon doesn't have it. You can get it through a last through ELB. So you can basically have an IPv6 load balancer to translate your IPv4 app, but they don't natively support it. Azure doesn't support it at all. They said they're working on it. And then Google, this is really a surprise since they have it everywhere else. They partially support it, but if I look at the Google Compute Engine, which is their major cloud service, it's IPv4 only. So that 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 one's I'm, I'm a little surprised that in 2016 it's still like that, but it is. Um, compute, none of them, none of them are interested. All IPv4. Storage, same way. Um, and then a lot of the mainstream sites. If I look at all my media sites, New York Times, Huffington Post, um, newspapers, Reddit, PayPal, Stack Overflow, GitHub. A lot of developer sites, none of them support it. Um, GitHub, I know there's been there's been a lot of pressure on them and nothing. So um, it's it's definitely a mixed bag. You know, some companies are doing it, but but a lot aren't. So if I turn off IPv4 support on my laptop, I can't talk to those sites. Not not without translation or proxy. Okay, so um, this is one question. I have spent a lot of time thinking about. So why is there so much reluctance? Why is it so hard to deploy IPv6? 
And really, um, in a totally separate industry, I heard a great analogy that I really liked, the interface analogy. So imagine that uh, I told you that the utilities are going to change our power standard, and we're going to have a new voltage standard, and uh, you know, it'll be a little more efficient, you know, there's not really much of a big benefit to you, but, but for the system as a whole, it's a really good thing. Uh, but it means we have to change all the outlets. What do you think? A few months? <laughs> We've already had that. It went from two to three. So, yeah. So, when you change, when you have a commoditized <coughs> interface, like an electric outlet, that everybody uses as a standard, and you try and change that, that is really hard. Right? Because it's a commodity. And by definition, if something is a commodity, if I change it to something else, it's a commodity. Who cares? Right? So, I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to invest in the commodity. That's, that's really, I think, the biggest problem, is IP is a commodity. I, nobody, and, and, but with home users and businesses, nobody cares about IP. I mean, this, maybe this group is an exception, but I talk to developers all the time. You know, how many, you know how many developers are really interested in how HTTP works or how internet routing works? They don't care. Most of the developers I talk to, they say, the internet has infinite bandwidth and zero latency and should do whatever I want. And it doesn't <laughs> fix it, right? That, that's, that's the extent of caring. So no, nobody cares about this problem. So changing the, changing the API from IPv4 to IPv6, because at the application layer, there is, not across the board, but in most languages, there is a difference. That's the resistance, because it's a lot of work. And really, am I getting any great benefit in the short term, no. Right? So, so I, I think that's why there's the resistance. And I can kind of see, right? Because there's five million cool things I can do. There's all the, I can write mobile apps and make all this money. And you want me to deal with IPv6? Go away. Right? I, I'm, I'm busy. So the other thing is, it's also very much like the grid. So I remember like five or six years ago, we had all kinds of grid problems, right? And really, when you plug something into the outlet, you know, do you stop and think about how it works? Or do you worry about, you know, is your local power company healthy? Do they have enough? You don't care. It's a commodity. It should just work, right? And that, that's, I think that's how we think of the internet. It's not my problem. Somebody else should deal with it. The carrier should fix it. You know, whatever. I'm busy. Go away. So I, I think the combination, and plus inertia, you know, we're kind of comfortable with IPv4. I've memorized all my IPv4 addresses. I don't have time to learn anything new. Go away. You know, unless it's going to make me money. So I think the combination of these three things has, has kind of created a formidable wall that is hard to climb. And that's where we're stuck. Um, however, even though there aren't a lot of benefits, there are some. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of in the past, like, I, I, think, I think with IPv6 <coughs> it's a bit of a tragedy in the commons. But, you know, like, you know, all of us are here because you know, we're in an industry we like, you know, we want to do cool things and make money, and I really I don't want to do something unless there's a benefit. So is there any benefit to IPv6 that would make me look at it? And it, it, it's not very strong, but, but there are some. So there's three things. Number one, if you're doing anything with IoT, with the Internet of Things, you definitely need, this needs to be on your radar. So, for example, since we're in Detroit, let's talk about connected vehicles. Gartner says by 2020, we're going to have 250 million connected vehicles on the road. And Gartner is not an IPv6 fan, but even Gartner will say, and pretty much anyone else in the industry will tell you, that there is no way that is happening with IPv4. It's impossible. You cannot make it work because of the scale. So now, doesn't mean it's going to happen this year, but before 2020, right, everybody agrees that there's got to be a transition to support that kind of scale. So if you're doing anything with IoT where there's billions of things coming online, you have got to start looking at this. Uh, mobility. So Facebook. So going back to your question, Dave, about is there any benefit for a user? Facebook did a study. Now, Facebook, most of their users are mobile from, from their smartphone or their tablet. And they basically looked, and they saw that, you know, they, they basically have 10% uh, of users globally connect to them with V6, uh, 23, this is, this is from mid-year, 23 from the U.S., but if they start narrowing that down to just 3G and 4G, with 4G connections that goes up to 45%, and now it's over half. And all of their growth and all of their focus is on mobile. That's where the, I think they said they make 80% of their money from mobile. 
right? So for Facebook, IPv6 is huge. And they took all of this data that they got from four different carriers. They had one of their data scientists analyze two sample sets of 155,000. And they conclusively found that there was a 15% better performance with IPv6. They suspect that's from CGN, but that's not conclusively proved. Now, 